And we are live. This is Sleepy Reader with my favorite Spider-Man fan, uh, Matt, uh, also known as Wednesday Serial. I almost said Agent 42Q still. How many years has it been since you were Agent 42Q? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Probably <Many>. three or four. <laughs> well, hello, Internet. We are here with yet another obsessing over Spider-Man uh, hangout. I think we've done some of them on my channel and a lot of them on Matt's channel. Um, last time we talked about Spider-Man 2099 and before that, we laboriously covered every appearance of Mysterio throughout Spider-Man's history. Um, the most interesting uh, appearances, I believe, were the Silver Age ones. Um, so now we're back to doing this similar thing, I think, with the lizard. I don't know if we'll cover his entire history. I may lose patience. <laughs> but tonight, we're going to talk about um, either five or six issues, depending on how we slice it, of Silver Age appearances of the lizard, um, which Matt picked. Perhaps he has a reason, or perhaps there's no, no reason. Matt kind of had the idea of going for less obvious people, you know, not doing Doc Ock or um, the Green Goblin or anything like that, at least for now. Yeah, well, so there's very few characters that I feel have, like, such a set rogues gallery, right? Like, the Fantastic Four has some villains, but, I mean, every, there's they always have to fight Doctor Doom, and then there's kind of flavors of chunks here and there. Of yeah, they used to have Galactus, but now Galactus is for everybody. Um, right, and then the Frightful Four kind of came and went, but or has different iterations, a la Sinister Six, though. Um, I don't know. Frightful I, Four, I, we're Fantastic Four, but Sinister Six are Spider-Man, right? Right, but I feel like it's the same kind of idea. Like, with different ages, you get different um, characters they want to highlight, because the villains change. Right. Um, so the and we're not covering the, just made me think, we're not covering the lizard's appearance in the Sinister Six because he also had a Sinister Six annual appearance. Right. And we did the same thing with Mysterio, just. Right. I suppose eventually, Sinister. as we run out of obscure things to do, we can do the Sinister Six. Well, the Sinister Six could be a video by its own. There actually aren't that many Sinister Six stories, less than oh, really? six, okay. I believe. And um, yeah, um, there's not Are a lot the, um, to chew on. Are the superior foes of Spider-Man the Sinister Six, though? Uh, I mean, if you want to count it, they play off that idea, even though there's only ever five of them. That's the ongoing joke. And then, um, I mean, it plays, but I mean, like, legit Sinister Six stories uh -huh. aren't that many. But the, the idea of it, I feel, has permeated further than the actual practice. Of right. It. Anyway, that's a total side issue. <laughs> I'm going to mention the people who are with us in the chat already. Oh, wow. Um, one of our favorites, 64-page special. Woo! Don't you hate purple pants? In fact, don't you hate pants? Heck, just go topless. So <laughs> <laughs> we were topless a few minutes ago, but we keep that private. Um, and 64-page special says blast. <laughs> and Rez Reads is here. She says, hi, y'all. Um, oh, man, Rez. Yeah, Mr. Gretzky's well. here, and he says it's knack. I'm, oh, back! It's back! Yay! It's Woo. back! Or yeah, oh, Gretzky. Back. Gretzky is one of my oldest fans. He predates you. Right. I mean, as far as following, I don't know how old he actually is, but he's been following my videos since. Long. I think he's followed all these Spider-Man videos. He may be the constant thread. I'm not sure if 64-page special words was here for them all. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and 64-page special wishes Rez or a fine birthday. Um, I saw her birthday video. She uh, she did a and a video for her birthday earlier today. If you haven't oh, seen wow. it, go check it out after we're done. Uh, <laughs> or right now. <laughs> you've, you've probably had enough. Let's already. be honest. Yeah. Um, so, th was there any other reason why you picked the, the lizard this time? Or well, so to go back to what you were saying earlier, just to kind of, I think we said this with the Mysterio thing, but part of the idea is, so like with Spider-Man, 
basically everyone like at some point touches on either the Green Goblin or Doc Ock. Like those are his two big baddies that come up all the time. There's also been a chunk of symbiote stuff, and I feel like that after it got initiated just kind of went through. But he also has a lot of memorable villains, but when you break it down, they don't show up as often as you might expect some of the most recognizable villains in comic books to come up in reality. And so I think actually looking and reading through and seeing like what's actually on the page with them has been a fairly interesting exercise. With Mysterio, I was blown away. Like I knew he wasn't in everything, but I thought he was in every era, basically. That's not even true. The Lizard, that's a lot closer to being true with. Um, we took just a quick peek at what he's been in. Right. Um, also... The Lizard has always been one of my favorites because I just happened to end up with a lot of Lizard comics early on when I was collecting. And so, like, the Spider-Man classics I got, I had two of them. And one of them was the one with the Lizard. Uh, the other one was some stupid robot in the high school. And uh -huh. that that issue alone caused me to really not like a lot of early Spider-Man. I realized it might have just been one particularly bad issue that I thought was representative of more than it actually was um it, well one of my favorite arcs as a kid was the lizard morbius arc which oh with the six arms the ones we're looking at which is on the cover that you don't like um <laughs> of the yeah. omnibus i think it's because i just don't like morbius uh-huh so for some reason as a kid the the mixture of the lizard and the morbius and spider-man getting six arms uh, was uh, very, very like um, overstimul comic book overstimulation to me. I got very hyper and excited by that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> stakes. But um, maybe we'll, we'll maybe we'll do at least one more lizard video. Maybe two more. I don't think yeah, I want to do we what we did. Highlights. With, I don't think I want to do what we did with Mysterio and read every bad story out there. No, but there is one bad lizard story I might push us through because as a kid I loved it. <laughs> okay, well we'll we'll consider that a highlight if it's one you loved as a kid. That's yeah. So um, okay, so you have a special affection for the lizard. I have a little bit of an affection for the lizard, or I thought I did. Um, I'm gonna try to screen share for a minute. Okay. And show. Let's see. How do I convince my screen share to? Pardon me a second. I guess I just screen share my whole screen. I don't know what else <laughs> to do. Um, so that's kind of an infinite. <laughs> I'm going to. Oops, block us out. So are you seeing are you seeing the Spider-Man now? Issue six? Yep, there you go. He so this is extra. the first appearance of the lizard, issue six. Um it's a pretty cool Steve Ditko cover, I thought. I think it's cool. Also, the design of the lizard here is pretty particular. I don't think you ever quite see him like this again. The in even in this issue? Oh, I mean, in the issue, certainly. I'm just saying this Ditko design of the lizard is very... It, it's like, may I come to lizard and the mouth has, like, no teeth. Um, right. It's it's even less human-looking than, uh, than the later lizard. Yeah, it's less alligator, more chameleon, which is interesting. I don't know, just something that really kind of popped me when I was looking at it again. And there's this awesome splash page, too. <laughs> Right, with all the alligator or crocodile. I can't tell from this picture. So we're in Florida, I think. Which makes it crocodiles, probably. Makes it alligators. Crocodiles are in Africa, I believe. So I'll just quickly run down the plot here while we're looking at it. Uh, there's this guy, the lizard. Do they say there? This guy, the lizard, um, does it say where he is? Swamps of Florida, Everglades. He's terrorizing people. Um, he uh, He's kind of, in my mind, your classic old school monster. 
Um, Spidey reads about him in the paper and eventually decides a way. Well, he doesn't just read about it. The bugle challenges Spider-Man to defeat the oh, lizard. Right. Talk you're about right. a literal call to action. Yeah. That's. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of racing through it. Oh, so no, I'm sorry. That's just such a great detail. You're right. It is a great detail. Basically, he eventually decides he can make money by taking pictures of himself fighting the lizard. And um, so eventually he and Jay, J and he, he goes to Spider-Man as, he goes to J. Jonah Jameson as the lizard and tells him to send Peter Parker to Florida to take pictures of him fighting the lizard. Yeah, yeah, as Spider-Man. Um, and you highlighted this on Twitter a while ago, but Peter Parker is extra snarky in this issue uh-huh yeah i also i love this panel here miss brent stop gaping and call peter parker i want to see him here at once but first <laughs> put some soft cushions on the floor under me yes sir wump tisk tisk poor gentle jonah <laughs> ow never mind those goddamn cushions <laughs> I would argue that that's a cotton or a slight error there because the wub comes out as a speech bubble and it should just be a sound effect. <laughs> well, it's a creative way to do the sound effect, right? And show where it's coming from. Unless Steve Jonas said wub really loud. <laughs> Maybe he said wub at the floor. <laughs> or Deadpool, it's the yellow bubble. Anyways. So it's kind of, I'd forgotten things being kind of sadistic about poor Jonah. <laughs> Well, he was a jerk. It's okay. It doesn't. It, I don't feel bad for. Him. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Reality, but of course it. But it just seems so funny to me. So th they fly down together to Florida, um, and there's some funny lines from Jonah about, um, you know, him paying the way and stuff like that. I, I, I'm not capturing them right at the moment, and then. Um, he has his big fight with the lizard and eventually learns the lizard's secret that he is a human who turned himself into a lizard by accident during his experiments. And he has this wife. I think yeah, that's Yeah, he just randomly starts talking to this woman and it's like, I'm here to warn her about the lizard. Oh, okay. Oh, it's his wife. Oh. Yeah, here I come crawling into your window. Don't be afraid. Yeah. It's a little... <laughs> It's and so then we learn the origin of how he became the lizard because he was trying to get g grow new limbs. Um, right. And I guess before experimenting on this rabbit here, he experimented on himself. Otherwise, he would have known it, seen it turn the rabbit into a lizard, I think. Yeah. And and we learn about his son. So I think the whole reason we have sympathy for the lizard is it because of his wife and son. Um. If he was just a bachelor or turned himself into a lizard, I'm not sure it would have the same effect. What's interesting, too, here is initially he's in the lizard form, and he's sad about, like, being this monster, and he has right. to go away from his family. But there's this quick churn, and it becomes just status quo from the lizard here on out, that whenever he becomes the lizard, he forgets about humanity right. and um, it becomes this monster who's fighting for lizard's domination over the planet. Right. He's a highly illogical character psychologically when he's the lizard. Right. Um, if, you, if you were to take it seriously. He's just a monster rather than a lizard in a way, psychologically. Well, it depends how you feel about reptilian psychology, I guess, but... I love this page here. Um, so anyway, he eventually... I forget how he... Uh, he has a... Uh, I don't know how there's a castle in the middle of the Florida, Florida Everglades. I forgot the explanation for that. Oh, well, before that, there's one moment that I do particularly love. Um, so Spider-Man, they're playing up the fact that Spider-Man's a scientist, and he's fiddling with the chemicals, and he's like, he has an end note based on the the notes of Dr. Connors. But then he's looking at this, you know, formula, and, he, and he's like, how am I going to get him to drink it? And I thought that was, like, the perfect moment of, like, here's where the Spider-Man part comes in. But <laughs> it was just this cool little break, cool little... Right, right. You know, Here we are. Um, 
Yeah, that is pretty cool. I hadn't even thought about that. And of course, Spider-Man, look! <laughs> and somehow he, yeah, Spider-Man's the only one who doesn't fear him, and that's why he hates Spider-Man, I guess. Because the fact that he hates Spider-Man becomes a big deal in later appearances. Yeah. So, um... <laughs> the list refers to the alligators. There they go. Huge alligators as pets. Which I think right. is kind of funny considering he's talking about reptilian domination. And then um, once they get to this castle, it is really a coolly choreographed fight. And that's one of the things I like about Ditko. He choreographs his fights very well. You know, yeah. it's not just big fists coming at you and something, you know. No, it gives the action a bit more relevancy to the story, I feel like. Yeah. You, you get some setting, you get some feeling of Spider-Man using his abilities in a fight. And it's not just this back and forth and... And then at the end, we get this return to domestic bliss. It's the child happily yeah. sleeping and the w husband and wife back together. So the order of life is returned, the proper order of life. And of course, and he burns his notes. Right. Because he has to keep the fact that Kirk Connors was the lizard a secret, otherwise it would be immoral. Right. And so this whole trip is a failure from the point of view of Peter Parker and uh, J. Jonah because no pictures were got of Spider-Man fighting him. Which seems odd. You think he still could have got off I, a picture. Yeah, I didn't understand why I didn't, but it, I don't know how Peter Parker survives as a photographer. <laughs> yeah. So let me uh, <laughs> stop sharing. So I'll just throw out there that my first reaction to this was in the early days of Marvel, like the early Fantastic Four and sometimes maybe the early Spider-Man too. I hadn't thought of this before. It's still kind of a throwback to the monster stories they did before they went into the superhero vein because um, Ditko was yeah. one of the major monster artists at the time. Because the whole taking Spider-Man out of New York and going to the Florida Everglades and this kind of story of the science gone wrong and it just felt like a universal horror movie with Spider-Man inserted to me in a sense. Um, but so that's, that's my big takeaway on it that it's interesting to see Spider-Man inserted into this horror movie kind of cliche. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, a lot of the villains have that kind of I'm a monster aspect to them, and I guess the way we kind of think of them now came mostly post-Ditko at the very least. So, um, to me, though, Spider-Man outside of the city, it just felt funny. It felt uh, off. So it felt like a more minor Spider-Man. Hello? Oh, I thought someone was knocking at the door. <laughs> um, and that, that is one really interesting aspect about this, is he goes to Florida and... That actually comes up with one of the later ones, but um, this because now when we think of Spider-Man, we think of it as one of the true blue like New York heroes, and I think they're trying to get other characters to be more global or whatever. But Spider-Man is New York, Daredevil is New York, like they're there. Um, but I think at this point they had him in New York, but the idea that he traveled for business or whatever didn't seem as big of a deal. And I, I kind of like that aspect because, you know, like, why wouldn't you go to, though the idea of the publisher and a freelance photographer going to, to a story <laughs> as well. 
Uh, right. How big of a story could this be that they would, I guess maybe the Bugle is supposed to be a really big paper, like the New York Times or something. It's supposed to be big, and they also issued a challenge to Spider-Man, right. so. I suppose it's more like the New York Daily News. I don't know if the New York Daily News in 1962 was, or 63, was so um, trashy as it became later on. Oh, yeah. I don't know enough about newspapers in New York City in the 60s, but. <clears throat> um, yeah, it just, maybe I'm too old or something. I, uh, it didn't grab me as much as some other um, Spider-Mans. But it is not that there weren't lots of good bits, but. I think overall it's a fun issue, but there's a lot of convenient points to keep the story moving along that definitely show the scenes more so than other stories. I mean, the fact that he travels to Florida off this pretense of the people calling him to it. Okay, and then he goes to Florida, then he just runs into the lizard when he's off to go get film and whatnot initially. Or go get film to get away from right. Jonah. And then... Um, and then he, he runs away, and then he runs right into his wife and finds out his whole backstory. And then the lizard just shows up again, and then they get into their altercation, they end at the castle, and then you're off. And yeah, it, it, it's not the best issue. <laughs> but I mean, it's not terrible or anything. I think I just, I wasn't as an adult able to get, I wasn't able to escape my feeling of being an adult and being cynical about the way the story was. And maybe it was just when I read it or something. Um, well, so no, I mean, time when we read the Mysterio issues by Ditko, I think I was able to just get into the mood of it better than I was with this, this particular issue. Well, in the Mysterio issue, I felt like was more natural. It, it was had more organic storytelling, it flowed better. Um, I still think this lizard one has fun. I mean, it introduces the lizard. It introduces the character pretty well. It's just the churns that it takes to get there uh, are a little hammy. But I think that's fine overall. I, I don't think it's the biggest deal. I don't think it's a bad comic. I mean, it's classic Spider-Man, so right. whatever. And it, it's more the psychology of a child. You know, there's a monster, but he's tragic, which is a typical Marvel thing, I guess. But... In, done in such a forced way, I guess. Or a, anyway, nothing wrong with it, but but not a no. standout for me. But even the tragic Marvel backstory, there's better. Oh there, yeah, there's yeah. better ones to be told. There's better ones to look at. Like this, the reason this issue is of note is it introduces the lizard. Um, that's that's it. Mr. Gretzky says Marvel did this well in the cartoon from 67 to 70. So there was that early uh, Spider-Man, right. friendly neighborhood Spider-Man type uh, show. Um, right, and uh, maybe they did it, maybe they did it effectively. I, I, I watched it when I was a kid, but I've only seen a few episodes as an adult. I haven't seen that. I mean, I've seen a few episodes of that cartoon, but I haven't it, seen the thing through and I don't remember that one. I remember the 90s one and they kind of had it, but I feel like the lizard was just in the, yeah, lizard was just in the New York to start and there were lasers and. Right. Yeah. It doesn't, well, it doesn't happen here, but I think later Connor becomes a professor. And yeah, I he becomes that his origin would be that Peter Parker meets him at college and is a teaching assist, you know, a lab assistant or something with him. And, that that was kind of what I was expecting. So when we went off to the Florida Everglade swamps, I was a little surprised. Well, I mean, Peter wasn't in college yet, and oh, true, he's in high school at this point, which makes him um, a really good high school science student to be able to. Yeah, right. Solve, solve the scientist's formula for. Him. They didn't let us play with chemicals in my high school class, except once. Um, and you're bitter about it, I can tell. I would have loved. I might have actually learned some science if I got to practice some. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Jason Bonney says, "Hmm, Spider-Man has horror roots. Can't ignore them. Do so at your peril, human." <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he does have a good point there because 
wasn't Amazing Fantasy basically a horror comic? Well, yeah, and the the human spider, the Spider Man that predated Spider Man, was the site, the tragic monster right. story idea. Also, in Denver, there was a man who was known as the Spider Man in Denver, who is this guy who's living in someone's attic before <laughs> they bought the house, then after, then one day they caught him sneaking down to grab food, and this whole like home invasion sort of story that rocked around for a little bit. Talk about a domestic nightmare. <laughs> you can read about it in a Blamo issue that Noah Van Skyver did if it's still in print. Huh. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's it is. Good. I mean, I guess there. I guess there may have been a process of them absorbing the horror roots of things and eventually figuring out how to bring it all into the urban setting. And here they didn't figure out how to do their horror in the urban setting that fits Spider-Man better, in my opinion, anyway. Well, and I think it's important to note that in pretty much every adaptation, when they retell the lizard origin story, the human beats are the same, but the plot's modified, and it's usually stronger between cartoons and movies and the ultimate universe and whatnot. It's, yeah, similar but different. Right. And one of the big horrors here, which continues throughout these books, is that your husband or your father becomes a monster who doesn't even remember that he loves you or cares about you at all. That's um, a good angle, yeah. And that, that was established here. Shall we move on to issue 44 of The Amazing Spider-Man? We shall. I'll try a screen share again. Come on, Google. There we go. Where crawls the lizard in New York? Okay, yeah. So there's the cover of 44. Um, oh, I guess, yeah, here we go. It's Ramita, and he does have the more iguana look. Now, was this one where we should have looked at the issue before? Or does it just jump in? I can't remember. I I think we're fine starting here because it. I mean, Kirk Connors at, at a certain point, Kirk Car Connors kind of becomes a side character in the Spider-Man mythos, and he's just right. kind of exists from issue to issue. And there's there's always kind of that play of, is he going to snap? Is he going to become the lizard mm -hmm. again? And uh, here he does. Spoilers from. What year was this? Um, uh, my, uh, it's six, 66. Okay. It's, um, I think it's still kind of early Romita. It's like, jazzy John Romita. Jazzy John, but he, I think he, in, in spots, I feel like I catch him trying to be Ditko-ish a bit. I mean, this is relatively early. Into, he he's not totally capable you know, of it, but I think he's trying at times. Well, especially with the lizard, I think going for the more awkward and kind of horish vibes. Did I say that yeah. right? Um, and he's still using a thinner inking line, I believe, than he would later on as he became more confident with his own slick style. And Ditko has a very thin inking line, but I don't know if there's really a connection there. But so here we're bringing the lizard to New York City, and we're starting in Grand Central Station, which for me was always the gateway to New York City because I used to take the train into New York City. I don't know if that's for other people, but maybe it is, and that's why they used it. Um, and just by chance, Peter Parker's taking his aunt uh, to catch her train to go on a Florida vacation, I think. Right. I... And with between this and the Mysterio one, I feel like there's some personal note that they try to hit on when they bring in a certain villain. They try to bring in a certain element from that villain to like Peter's melodrama. So with Mysterio, I had like a whole psychology angle, which makes sense. And with the Lizard, I guess it's Florida, but. The idea that he went to Florida to go see him, and then when the lizard shows up again, he's sending his aunt to Florida. I, you know, the, the small little connections. It's just kind of interesting to note. If anyone's out there watching and 
is willing to leave me a comment to tell me if my screen sharing is actually showing up because there's something kind of confusing in the Google instructions here. But I don't know if I'm just sharing with Matt or if I'm sharing with everyone. But anyway, um, so sorry, Matt, for that interruption. Uh, Oh, no, I was just saying Florida's a connection with the lizard. That's right. And so they're, coming, they're going, coming from Florida. She's going to Florida. It gets Aunt May out of the picture for a while, I guess, or just as a good excuse for them to all meet up at Central. So it's another kind of contrivance. But somehow it feels easier for me to buy in because it's in, in New York, but still felt pretty contrived. Yeah, I felt like it was a little smoother this time. Also, him being coming off the train, you know, stresses him out a bit, and then he forgot his freaking potion. Yeah, which, come on, man. It's a man. pretty big thing to forget. <laughs> yeah, get, get one of those uh, day-a-week pill poppers and set yourself out. And I mean, but it's, it's not it's like a migraine. <laughs> It's quite fun to see him transform into the lizard. He's struggling with it. It, it well, has a kind of casting himself into the shadows, right. but the green pops out. It's kind of like the Hulk. Right. And it's at first he's just got this evil lizard hand. And then. Yeah. Because the arm grows back. And then he's fully the lizard. So you think he do, they're doing the face differently here than Ditko did? The face of the lizard? I, it's pretty similar this time, but it is a bit more. I think later on he develops more of a snout. I guess he does have a bit of a snout here. I mean, he gets teeth and the whole right thing. That's how I classically think of the lizard as more of an alligator man than a iguana man. So very quickly, Spider-Man reconnects with the family. And it to me, it's all about helping out the family. But, I mean, he recognizes them this time and, like, oh, hey, but he, they don't know Peter Parker. They know Spider Man. So I'll shop by a Spider Man. They're all freaking out about right. their husband. Okay. You know what that means. And I'm like, well, okay. So I, it, it worked for me. <laughs> I, plus, I like the idea that the Connors and Spider Man kind of have this understanding and. It's not like a play to his personal life, but it is a personal drama. Right. It, so. It's interesting there at the top of this page to see um, basically Romita's redrawing the splash page from issue six in that in that top panel. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you could, if you want to take art notes between Ditka and Romita, there's a key one to go to. Well, and I'm finding I'm really loving Romita. <laughs> I know you're supposed to like Ditko better, but... Um, I, you know, I, it's... I mean, neither of them are my favorite. Uh -huh. And... But, I mean, I'm starting to appreciate more, but I'm also... I, I don't know. Like, I, I like Romita, I like Ditko, and I don't think I could honestly really take anybody ragging on either. They're, right. they're, they're dramatically different. And I can understand a lot of people who are loving Ditko, not liking Romita, because that is a harsh churn. It, uh, it probably was quite a shock at the time. But you know, when like looking at this page, even though it kind of is like an, a page out of Archie, <laughs> the Archie <laughs> comics, it, yeah, and it is much slicker than Ditko. Oh, there's Kit there's a great. He still does a great job of making everyone's slickly drawn face very distinct from everyone else everyone's personality and everything i really like the way he does the way ramita does faces and character speaking of that can we go back a page because there's one j jonah here that's uh <laughs> in that middle left panel I, something about his face on that one just hit me as like something went a little right here <laughs> i think it's his eyes Talking about this one? No, no, no. Um, the one right before it. This, this one? Yeah, that one. <laughs> Look all you want to. It's a free country. <laughs> he looks a little bit like Jack Kirby, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but with the Hitler mustache. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, we know the secret behind Jonah Jameson was Lee's way to vent about Kirby. I always, for some reason, assumed that J. Jonah Jameson and was like a mirror, a dark mirror image of Stan Lee, because <laughs> he's the <laughs> self-promoting, you know, editor of a publication or publisher of a publication. But you know, he's always oh. he's always the representative of his own publication. Um, oh God, I that's public face. That's deep. I like that. <laughs> the silver spoon. But like uh, Farnsworth is a Farnsworth who is only going to play an important role in some later issue is a great example of uh, to me how Archie. the faces are just all done really well. Well, Farnsworth looks like really three well other like kind of no-name Spider-Man villains that eventually, it, like, he just looks like the bad guy. You know what I mean? Right. He's a classic movie bad guy, and I don't know. Yeah, he's a character I, actor. I think both Ramita and Ditko do great jobs with character. Um, and in a way, Ramita established Peter Parker with this very distinctive look that was maybe more marketable, like more instantly recognizable than the Ditko Peter Parker. But And I think there's one panel here that kind of hits why people might kind of hate some of the Romita era Spider-Man a bit with, uh, I think it's a page back again, with Mary Jane coming up to the table. Three living, breathing males to only one gala? Where has this place been all my life? <laughs> yeah, that's just what my life was like. Like, come on. <laughs> You want to talk male gaze, boys? Here it is. Okay, I'm having. Sorry. <clears throat> you keep talking. I'm having a technical issue. Well, and while we're talking the love life here, like Mary Jane's here, and she's just going for all the attention, and Gwen Stacy just has her face on the entire time just kind of like glaring in the background and barely says a thing the last thing she says is gentlemen we're trying to study like she's kind of the straight laced one the kind of like right. overbearingly so and it, yeah it's very kind of archie right like you yeah get these characters that are a little too one way and oh here we go I wonder the if teenagers back then actually wow. said dad and things like that. She's. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's gotten into Pete. Even a scholarship student like him can't afford to let his studies slide. Like, she's just. They're worried about it, whatever. But Mary Jane's the fun one, even now. Like, who would you rather date? Come on. <laughs> well, yeah, only her blondness, I guess makes Gwen a good girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Um, it does kind of bother me that every, all the girls actually want Peter Parker. <laughs> he, if only he knew, he, he doesn't really have to struggle. Well, but I mean, at this point, he's smart and he's got to be Spider-Man ripped, right? So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And he's just a little bit of a jerk. Like, he's... <laughs> well, yeah, he's pretty insensitive to what the girls may be feeling. Um, That's how I picked up all the ladies in college. I learned in the pages of Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, become insensitive and then women love you? Is that what you're saying? Just just the right amount. <laughs> I, oh. I think you just need to be arrogant. You can be arrogant but sensitive <laughs> somehow. There you go. Um, uh, but that's for another video. I, I like that though. The, the here we go. Sound effects that are that are not in speech bubbles. <laughs> Crash. So um, the the rept not the reptile the lizard is already he's obsessed with Spider Man. He remembers Spider Man from the last time he existed. I guess the ripped dial. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and he uh, and so he's just committing crimes to get Spider Man in trouble. <laughs> okay. 
Sure. With luck, Spider-Man himself will be accused of this robber. <laughs> I, you don't think people will notice the giant green... Like, if anyone he's going to be confused for, it's the Hulk. Like, <laughs> giant green monster in purple pants? Come on. Right. <laughs> really? Yeah, you should he take does the, the Hulk in the lab coat. <laughs> it's funny that... Um, that Dr. Connor was wearing a lab coat when he took the train from uh, Florida to New York City. Well, he had to wear his Dr. Kurt Connors outfit. Otherwise, how would anybody recognize right. him? And all scientists wear purple pants. So when they do become a green monster, they get the green and purple. Also, I like how Sp Spider-Man reads there's a robbery in the paper. It had to be the lizard because... You're in Spider-Man's universe. There's someone <laughs> robbing a bank every week. How could you be like, of course? Right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And at this point, Spider-Man has the bicycle. Even though technically, according to Spider-Man lore, he never got a driver's license. Oh, really? Which it's still legal to drive a motorcycle without a license, unless that was different in the 60s. I don't believe well, so, though. Um, you were allowed to ride a... When I was growing up, you were allowed to ride um, a certain class of vehicle without a driver's license. Yeah, but that's not a moped. That's a motorcycle. I guess I, I had one that was similar to a moped but didn't have pedals that I was allowed to ride, and it, it had a, a controller on it so I could only go 25 miles an hour. But Right, but I mean, this thing's a... So why did they've actually said he doesn't have a license and yet they have him? Yeah, it's him. like a they bring it up and Bendis loves that fact. He's brought it up in three points in his Avengers run, and uh, I and just know he was that riding around on the Spidey Dune bus around me, town. Trust me, part of the lore. I I've read that I don't know how many times, but yeah. So another law he's breaking, then vigilantism and breaking and entering and forged identities and. Probably a few others. So I find that I really like the poses that Romita put Spider-Man in. Um, in the fight scenes in particular. Yeah. Or if we're talking about kinetic stuff, but Kirby kind of has like a lot of aftermath, I feel, of a hit. Or like right. setting up, like we were talking about the setting and whatnot. But I mean that like throwing into the trash can or whatever, I feel like is very kinetic and very... Romita. Romita has a lot of, like in this picture and um, here, there's a lot of drama. You can feel the. the yeah, if you go back. Struggling. One, to that one you were just on. This one, yeah. Yeah, like you feel the impact because he's on the ground, but you could see where the lizard hit him. He hit the wall and then right. he hit the ground. Like there's almost three panels in this one right here. Like, Talk about a master class of just kinetic storytelling. Like, that is right. beautiful. Oh, and there's a there's a camera in one of the panels, so you know he got some photos, so he's learned us some lessons. Yeah, where was that? Oh, that was a ways back, I think. But yeah, you're right. They were careful to show the camera. Yeah, I, I mean... You can look at Romita and say he's very slick, and that, and that I think, I think partially because I was arguing with someone on on uh, Twitter about it a, while, a few days ago. But um, yeah, that that focusing just on his slickness makes you maybe not noticing all his other storytelling moves. Um, well, so I see. Here's the thing: I totally get the debate with Peter Parker and people people siding with Ditko being the stronger artist. There, you know, he's this weird, awkward kid. It was this atmosphere. It was this idea that's more human because not everyone's a freaking movie star. All that, like, totally. But when you're talking the Spider-Man stuff, I feel you can go more blow for blow because. Right. Romita's Spider-Man has an energy and feel to it that I wish every modern artist would take more notes from because there's just little things he does thinking through the like moment, the setting, the and stuff that Ditko definitely doesn't do because there's a lot more background in every Romita panel, especially for the action ones, and there are in the Ditko ones. And it just 
gives a sense of scale, feeling, detail. It's all there. And so, right. I also wonder if yeah, the, the technology of printing really comes alive in, in uh, like I was just zoomed in on that tiny panel. Yeah. And there's, you can see bits of the city there. And then, I mean, he does have his cheer panels. Like, there's that one with those in the red background, right? Like, right. But, like, it's a red background all of a sudden. Like, it's so dynamically different from every other one that at that point, you almost have to be like, well, visual contrast sometimes. Like, sometimes you need less. Well, another interesting thing about when they were doing comics, the Marvel style, yeah. where Stan Lee or then someone else would come in and dialogue later, the artist didn't know how much dialogue would be in the panel. Right. So you had to always try to guess. I've got to leave some room here and some room there for the dialogue. So I think that's often why when you have a close-up, there's no background. But yeah. So like in this one, he probably left the whole top of the panel empty. Um, either that or the inker lucked out and didn't have to draw a background that he drew back there, <laughs> that the penciler drew back there. Right. Although I think in this particular issue, he is the inker. So he's both the inker and the penciler. Right. Well, he's lucky he didn't have Bendis writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at that. There's a lot in the background there. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, look, there's a cityscape in the background of the window. Now that would just be, you know, like. Right. Anyway, yeah. I mean, I can definitely see, like, the argument that Spider-Man was really quirky under Ditko, and it was more kind of indie, if you will, or more of an outsider kind of work of art. But I think it's still a, a great work of superhero art under under Ramita, and I, I'm going to stick with that feeling. <laughs> also, I have a question about the 60s. Uh-huh. Because Mary Jane starts calling Peter dad, which is... Yeah. Weird. Is that a thing? Is that a yeah, thing I think that it people... was. Um, okay. I don't know if dad, but you know, they were, people were always talking, calling their their boyfriend their old man. Yeah, old man, daddy oh, but just say dad is a little. Mm. I don't think she's calling him dad as his boyfriend either. She's just calling a guy dad. There's like daddy o. Apparently, they used to say daddy o in the late 50s, early 60s. So I have no idea if this is Stan Lee's mistake or a real thing, because if this is 1966, I was five years old. <laughs> and you weren't hip yet? I was not hip. Hep? Oh, th <laughs> there's an old Spider-Man joke. There's one time where Aunt May goes, I'll try to be hep like the kids. Appears like <laughs> it, it's hip. <laughs> Go away. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure when when what language was used in real life, but I'm sure Stan Lee was not really hep to it. Yeah, I'm glad Spider-Man stopped trying to be so down with the kids. Ditko or Ramita, I, I love Silver Age Spider-Man covers, I'm going to say. Most of them, there's a few that there's simpler, way simpler than what you'd see now. But they just well, but they're more representative of the issue. There's a little more going on. It's not just Spider Man, right? No. It's and there's not five covers to every issue, right. which is well, they did a really good job of making it a little bit of storytelling, but also have a real popping poster like kind of cover it's no surprise to me that uh other than neil adams covers i always prefer as a kid i always preferred marvel covers to uh to dc because of this no idea what dc looked like back then they weren't terrible i mean i like i now like dc silver age covers but as a kid i think these just really overwhelmed them i don't think i've read any dc silver age stuff that is huh there's a hole. <laughs> well, I'll soon be sending you a four hundred dollar omnibus of it. <laughs> I'll I'll look forward to that. If you look quickly here, you might think you're looking at a Ditko page. I think. Huh. Also, 
Yeah, Spider-Man, the wrapped bandage thing is a cool little touch. I always like it when yeah. Spider-Man's kind of hurt, but continues going right. on. Like, the, like you get some injury and you get some weight from issue to issue and the fact that he's actually, like, been in a fight. And right. I, I feel like I see that a lot more with Spider-Man than pretty much any other character. He's a good role model that way for kids of not giving up because I... <laughs> Yeah, but also not like admitting that you don't feel pain or something stupid right. too. Like I don't know, Batman. Uh, yeah, yeah, the pain is real. Um, yeah, it's not easy for him or anything like that. Yeah, it's not easy. It's a struggle, but he's pushing yeah. on. Like, uh, yeah, there there's you go. times when Batman is like shot in the shoulder or something, and he seems to be completely it's only a flesh wound. <laughs> right, and and a day later he's back in action. Fucking Batman. <laughs> another reason why spider-man is superior i love these scenes where spider-man walks across his webbing like a tightrope yeah i like that idea i feel like some of the like post mcfallen the webbing did have that look but i also feel like certain applications or ideas of use kind of went by the wayside of it being you know, New York City based, and then it just became more cinematic. So you, you wouldn't do certain things with it. And the idea of it just being a line, I felt like they did more stuff like this. I think last time we talked about Romita, I, I noticed this too, but I noticed how he, on a page like this, where it's ordinary life, he packs in the panels. And as you get closer and closer to a big scene, the panels get bigger and bigger for a while. Huh. or looser and looser or something. I don't know. The The scope just seems to get bigger and brighter. Well, yeah, so you go from the grid, then you go to three two by two, so and you then you have... The grid, and then you start breaking up the nine-panel grid as tension is rising. Yeah, and, and then you have a six-panel. Panel. And then three panels. Three. And then, and then three, three, three but... a really big one. Yeah. And then you go to four and then two. He really lets the page do stuff, but each page is kind of its own moment in a way, too. Right. Yeah, so I mean of course then this kind of this page is more awkward where he mixes the two together. But anyway, I just really I I think that's why I um I enjoyed this story the most because one, it, it brought the lizard into the urban environment, and two, it just had all these good Romita qualities, I thought, to it. Uh, also, backaways, there's a lot with uh, Billy and um, the wife. Is wife. that in the previous issue? Or no, is no, it... just the past few pages. Um, page four. Um, but yeah, they're all this. Billy and the wife stuff is more believable than it was. Um, well, it, the first time around, they come to life more as human beings. What's you brought up the horror idea, and they maintain that with the lizard. Like this woman is in fear for her life, but has this weird connection with the whole thing. She's worried about it being the lizard at, at her doorstep, and the lizard's coming in, but it doesn't really remember the Connors. And right, but she's coming in. She's taking care of her son. The son's noticeably older, which is something I really like, because it's very rare that you get a decent progressive progression of age with any comic book character. And True. here's one where I feel like he's growing up, but he's going to regress in age as the years Oh, really? Okay. On. But the next story arc, he's even older. He's oh, right. like a pre um, or something. Yeah. Which is interesting, because I don't think by that point, Peter Parker has aged as much as this supporting character. Right. Um, but this idea that there's this family just to fear, like they love their husband, but he can go off at any minute. You could read that as a parable for domestic situations, but it, it's played right. with this, you know, sci-fi angle to be interesting, but also to kind of allow you to read into that in a few ways. If you have any reason to bump up with some reality there, I think it's right. You could read it as domestic that. violence. You could also read it as there's the parental fear that you will accidentally hurt your children or yeah, psychological, psychological issues, alcoholism, 
a whole number of them, but. And did you ever that, have, as a child, wonder if your parents were really your parents or if they were monsters or, I used to imagine my mother might've been replaced by a witch at one point when I was a kid. I don't know if everybody goes through that. I vaguely remember something with a kid where I learned, you know, superpowers came from radiation. The microwave <laughs> gave off radiation. So I kept hanging around the microwave hoping something would happen. But <laughs> that's a separate, uh, a separate yeah. mythology, I think. But anyway, yeah, the, the themes of the family and everything that were there in the Ditko issue just seemed to be. And it's probably Stan Lee here that I'm really talking about. Stan Lee on his second round of dealing with um, dealing with the lizard has maybe hit the nail, or maybe Romita has also helped him, and bringing it into the urban setting has also helped him just make these elements stronger, I felt, than, than they were in that first appearance, which more felt to me like a hokey horror movie from the 40s or something. Although I do object strongly to this one panel where it says, another mighty Marvel first. Knowing how titanically talented our riotous readers are, we're leaving this panel for you to write your own dialogue. If you can get someone to play hearts and flowers softly in the background, it won't do a bit of harm either. That just seemed really weird to me. I mean, particularly why the fans of Spider-Man would want to write this particular scene. Who knows? Although you skipped the uh, the climatic lizard fight. Uh huh. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm just skipping around. So they end up on a train, and there's a big old train fight between the lizard and Spider Man, which I don't know. Like, I know it's a train, and that's a classic action thing, but compared to where comics have been recently, it feels smaller and nicer. Um, but sure. the whole little trick is the lizard's kicking Spider Man's butt, because at this point, the lizard is basically one of the strongest villains Spider Man faces um and he has the ability to psychically control lizards like he's a real threat in comparison to pretty much everyone else and the way he takes out the lizard is by tricking him into a cart that uh is yeah like a freezer cart and so because it's a colder environment the lizard you know slows down is able to be taken out and i thought you know that's a small churn but enough of a churn that you see how that would be a big advantage and it comes through and i'm like Dude, that's that's clever. That's cool. That's fun. It's not a big, you know, mystical laser. Right, and it's brain. Collection. It's brains in in a way that is yeah, like you say, not a mystical laser or a secret formula that somehow we can magically figure out. Although I'm sure that comes later, but yeah. Well. Um. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. I like the smallness. I the fights have more at stake in a way when what's really at stake here is the lives of three or four people rather than, than the whole world or New York City as a whole or something. Although I guess if the, I don't believe the threat of the lizard that he's gonna uh, rally all the other lizards in the world and have them attack humankind or all the other reptiles or whatever. I think that's just his fantasy that he can do that. But maybe he can really do that, I don't know. Maybe with the lizard ray that takes all the satellites across the world, he'll manage it. But um, and maybe later on, when they need to make him even more powerful, they will have him control more lizards or something. I don't know. It comes up. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but then we get this whole play with the Connors. I do like. There's something cool about, with all the villains, they tend to just be a villain, but with the Lizard and Kurt Connors, you get a nice churn of, Connors is actually a decent guy with a family, and so when things are set right, you get kind of a moment with him. You get this little moment with the Connors, and I, I like that churn because it, it's a distinct separation from pretty much every other spider villain. Right. Um, where curse you, Spider-Man, I'll get you next time. No, it's, it's a family moment. And so like things are set a little more right from something that... I feel like when the lizard's a lizard, things are actually a bit darker compared to your average stock standard Spider-Man villain story. And... Because of the horror element. And I, right. I just... 
I like that churn, and it's a beat that's hit every time, but it, it works every time because it's just kind of the formula for the lizard. And, I don't know. Something to that. Yeah, so I I really, this is where the lizard gelled for me. Um, so the next, whoops. Oh, that's weird. So, sorry. Um, the next series of is either issues 75, 76, and 77, because Connor appears in issue 75, but then it really only becomes a lizard story starting in 76. Yeah, but I mean, I read 75, and I think that's important to note to something I was saying before. We don't necessarily need to dig on the whole thing, but I mean, these issues go like, the end of one, and then a minute later is the start of the next one. Right. So, and 75 is a really good issue, I thought. Oh, it's great. And this is when Ramita's Ramita. They have in Mooney. Right. Schmeck is doing the letters. I don't know if that matters. <laughs> Artie Sweet Lips Simek. Sweet. Yeah, this is Ramita doing a really good job. But then the following two issues are by John Buscema, uh, inked by yeah. Jim Mooney, trying to make him look like Romita. Right. And I re I'm, I'm a big John Buscema fan, but I'm not a fan of Buscema doing Spider-Man. He's fine, but I thought Romita is so much better. Well, he's trying to be Romita here. And... Yeah, but he just... Whatever it is that Romita has, and that kind of highlighted to me, there's something in Romita's storytelling that... John Buscema did not have uh, that. Well, when you're up and really coming, you're trying it. to literally be the guy for the people who aren't reading the credits, and hopefully they don't notice the art right. change. Like that's for people who have the eye for it. That's always going to fall short. I feel so. If you're a big fan, like I don't know, like I see where you're coming from. I agree, it's not as good, but and it's not that it doesn't look good, but it. I don't know when. I thought that Buscema didn't um, get the action done as well and the emotion done as well. Um, that there was something extra that Romita put into it. Well, yeah, but, that's my whole point but here. But like, using the same inker who has probably been told, make this look as much as possible like the other issues. Oh, and sure. But I mean, like, like, like we've been saying, Romita has something that I haven't seen in many many when i say modern i mean i'm thinking basically comics i've been reading this whole time without reading older comics right and there's certain churns certain aspects certain details ramita hits that just other artists just don't because he was he was a master of the craft and so saying yeah john bishama trying to be ramita just doesn't isn't quite as good i just yeah it's not but well, yeah, I know they weren't bad issues, but uh, it just highlights to me um, again people who are putting down John Ramita. If you look at it, there's there is a special quality. I keep saying that, so um, yeah, there is. There's an X factor. There's a there's something special with Ramita that yeah, it's so. Weird. Like here's a page. I think it's like page two or three. Um, it's just very exciting, just the way Spider-Man's swinging across the town and the way he approaches the villains and pulls them out well, the window. <laughs> well, and the, the the panel, I think, that's the one that would, like, separate him from other artists is where you can see Spider-Man in the shades, but he's not actually really in the panel. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, let me get to that one. Yeah, that's a really cool one. Yeah, it, it's that sort of stuff that... Busema is normally a brilliant artist, but he, I don't know, he just doesn't get down and dirty enough for Spider-Man. Um, that's the but, wrong term. I don't really know what it is, why he didn't seem as good to me. So this whole issue is the conclusion of a fairly big Spider-Man arc that's been played on a few times of this character, Silvermane, who is Magia. Um, am I saying that right? Are you supposed to pronounce it? I'm never not. sure how they pronounce Magia. That's how I pronounce it. But it's clearly yeah. the Mafia. But for some reason, Stanley didn't want to say the Mafia. Well, yeah. 
Hydra's to Because the mafia were running the newsstand distribution back then, probably. <laughs> okay. Um, but Silvermane wanted to recapture his youth, and then here he finally gets it, and we see that play out throughout the issue. Right. Um, and I also, thought that was, you know, for what might be a cliched kind of story, but I thought that was really well done and really well paced, the Silvermane slowly becoming a baby and then ceasing to exist to totally spoil the story. But. Yeah, well, no, and I, I think that's a good turn, and it works, but yeah. But also here, this other guy, this other gangster, is man, Mountain Mariko, who's a... Uh, he's just a fun Spider-Man villain that pops up every... Right. Yeah, every I seem to remember him from somewhere else, but I don't specifically remember where. There's a particular web of uh, Spider-Man issue I have that he pops up in that's just <clears> funny. <throat> but yeah, he's just kind of a goon. <laughs> But you, need, if you're running the Magia, you need lots of goons. All right. And Spider-Man comes in to save the day, yada, yada. And then Kirk Connors is here because he helps crack. In order to get this Fountain of Youth idea, this idea of the tablet has to be cracked. And they bring in a scientist instead of a magician, which I think is an interesting play on ideas right there in mm -hmm. of itself. But in doing so, Kirk Connors gets stressed and becomes a lizard. Right, so that's a that a very convenient and clever way to link the two stories and keep the sort of serial story going. But I mean, here's a moment where they've been playing this whole Silvermane thing, and he finally gets what he wants, and it's supposed to be this big deal, and it ends up not because it ends up more or less resolving itself. Right. Um, and then you have these other goons around, but Spider-Man takes care of them more or less. Although there's this one moment where Silvermane's in his twenties, and Spider-Man's like, "Oh my God, he's." Younger and more powerful. He's a man in his 20s, which is like everyone else you fight. I just didn't understand what the deal was. You have the proportions. I, I didn't understand the why Silvermane is such so such a powerful fighter. Is he more than human that he can even have any chance against Spider-Man, who has, you know, the strength of a spider? Which is. I mean, they're playing up the drama for an issue. I mean, let it slide for the story, yeah. right? But no, I, I did let it slide. Yeah, um, when you're reading it, it's there, but when you pull back at all, you're like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> It was um, very pleasing to see Silverman get his just desserts. They did a good job of making him someone you wanted to see get his comeuppance. Right. I, I do kind of like that, though. Like, when he's in his 20s, he's loving it. Then as he gets younger, he's like, teenager? Okay, okay. And then he becomes a kid. He's like, no! And you're <laughs> like, yeah, nobody wants to be eight. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah. I thought this was a particularly good Romita page, too, since he t dealing with uh, the way it worked worked out in the end. <laughs> and the other thing is, this is why it works well with Spider-Man, this being a Spider-Man villain, is pretty much any other hero, including up to, like, Captain America, would just probably have a smirk at this point or something, like, God, is just right. dessert, some one-liner or something. The guy who's known for one-liners kind of gets the, like, the human emotion, the the sadness of this, like a man just killed right. himself, like chasing right. eternal youth. In some ways, he was about to die anyways, but he got a moment of recapturing his youth and for not or whatnot. But yeah, his prize will be forever. Like the fact that you have a character that recognizes that, recognizes the human element of it, makes it work better. If, you, if this was a Punisher story and this how it ended, it's like just saved me a bullet or something. Like no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't play, but. Here, I, I feel like that made it the right choice of villain to hero. Right. And maybe this is what, you know, we can still believe Spider Man at this point is kind of new to being a superhero. But I wonder if this kind of thing is hard to pull off now. You know, that it would be. I mean, Spider Man does that. He's seen it all by now um, in the, you know, current comics. So. He'd have to have a different kind of reaction, I suppose. But anyway, yeah, you, you really hit it on the nose with what makes this different, what makes Spider-Man different than like Captain America or the Fantastic Four would have responded a whole different way to this or any other. Yeah, and then at the end of the issue, the Connors pop in and Billy Connors looks like Team Venture. I don't know. Right, yeah, I, I take him to be about 12 years old or maybe 13 here. A dashing and 14 year old. I don't know. And then we get Lizard with like the snout, but not really the teeth yet. 
Uh, oh, yeah, there's the snout is developing. So that's probably how the first time Romita had to draw in the Ditko way, and now Romita's evolving his own lizard. Oh, that, yeah, that's probably it, yeah. I like the way they do the eyes in this last panel, too. Yeah, in my, what I was reading, it didn't come through because the color is all jack. So, yeah, right. it really shows. Um, yeah, big John Bershema. And then. Right, Jim but Roman. the cover is still by Romita. And this is a, a wonderful cover. I mean, the perspective and everything. You get in that perspective, but still the main figures, you know, pop out. But then yeah. already. It, doesn't this lizard look a little wrong here? It looks like an armadillo. <laughs> it kind of looks like Cerebus, yeah. It's Cerebus. <laughs> so Busema was ahead of his time. <laughs> but Stanley loved Busema. Damn and women! Big John Busema, innovator. Slim right. Mooney, illustrator. So I think Busema was probably just doing what they call breakdowns. If they're calling Mooney the illustrator, that means Mooney worked from very rough pencils. And Mooney by himself is a good artist, but he doesn't have the zing of any of the main pencilers. I don't know if Mooney ever penciled by himself uh, Spider-Man, but I've certainly seen him pencil other Marvel comics. Well, and when you're looking for it, you can see why this isn't Romita or whatever. But I think if you're just a kid reading the comics and it's true, it's close. Whatever, it's close. Like, yeah, unless you're paying attention for it, I just yeah. I, I, I mean, he does a good mimic job, but I mean, it is a mimic job. It but it affected me like somehow the story just didn't have as much impact. Well, and uh, Peter looks like Babyface McGee. Um, Aunt May isn't quite there. God, I don't even know. I, I can't. So. Harry Osborne comes in with a Fu Manchu all of a sudden. That panel. <laughs> bothered me on some visceral right. level that I cannot shake. That is one of the most Stanley up. had to quickly make up a reason why he did it, that Mary Jane digs a Fu Manchu. No. <laughs> this whole panel, hi, hair, still sporting your new Fu Manchu, huh? You know it, son. It may not turn you on, but it drives Mary Jane mad. Well, excuse me, old buddy. Gotta run. You're gonna give me a complex. I'm starting to think I got bad breath. Maybe you have a Fu Manchu. Maybe you should. <laughs> God, like, mmm, that is. Ah, uh, should have let him. Just ask Harry to pencil that or ink that out because it's such a small picture anyway. Right. Um. Yeah, that's what we need. Scarlet Witch. No more Fu Manchu. I wonder if teenagers or college students said, you know it, son, to each other back then. <laughs> I have a feeling that's like a World War II expression, but I don't know. We said it to each other now, ironically. Uh, I don't know, but. I know, I didn't notice before in the next panel as he walks by a newsstand, the guy is putting out copies of the Silver Surfer. Oh, yeah. Which Shout out to Sam was doing with Stan Lee. Oh, and really? I that John Buscema, you know, was called to fill in at the last minute because he was a famously very fast artist, and he was doing beautiful, brilliant work on Silver Surfer. Um, so yeah, I guess this was at the same time. Silver Surfer. <laughs> I'm joking for all two people watching or whatever. We Do have we get eight, any new comments? We have eight viewers, but no one's commenting because <laughs> this is too dull to comment to. I bet they're reading comics while listening to us. Yeah, that's that's probably fair. That's what um, I or, and then I like how Gwen Stacy's like, "You're cheating on me," and you're like, "Yeah, right. probably," but God, it Peter just looks ten years younger all of a sudden. Also, I noticed um, that. Oh no! Oh, that's interesting. So on your copy, it's uh -huh. colored correctly. That's Robbie's hand, and it's black. On what I'm looking at. That initial hand is supposed to be Robbie's, and it's a white hand, and then it's <laughs> right in the next page. So that's weird because I would have assumed these uh, Marvel Unlimited copies came from the same digital files that they printed your book on. Oh, 
Hold on. So I'm looking at the digital one, and I want to make sure that's... Oh, you're not looking at the uh, the hard Let map. me look at the omnibus. It's going to take me a second to find it. Right. There's the Prowler. Well, I mean, <clears throat> Buscema is a great artist. This is maybe minor Buscema, but I would have been perfectly happy with this as a kid. You're right. And it's just that I was so into the Ramita. Yeah, but no... It looks like Buscema maybe does the next four or five issues. Oh, Hold on, I have to hoist an omnibus to my webcam. Can't and Buscema made a Connor's son look even bigger. There's the hand. It's white. That's funny. Huh. Yeah. So they must have corrected it at some point, but who knows when. And that, that omnibus was just published. Yeah, but it is a reprint of the Masterworks. Right, but you would think they pages. would go from the files, the most recent files they have or something. So they're kind of lazy in that sense. Well, so when was that correction made? Or maybe it just happens to be that way on your um, digital one. What, what Spider-Man nerd is going through it is like, I have color corrections for these issues and Marvel's listening to them. Like, oh, that's <laughs> fascinating. I want to know, but I don't know how you find that out. I'm just thinking if they corrected this at some point, it's just surprising that they wouldn't use the corrected version Can when you, they publish a okay. hundred dollar edition, whereas right, on Marvel right. Unlimited. And this has probably been on on Mar I'm sure Spider Man was one of the early stuff they put on Marvel Unlimited, so it's probably been on here for six years or seven years. I assume Robbie is um, brown skinned for the rest of your version. Yes. Yes. Robbie always seemed like the character that I wanted a little more of in my memory of reading old Spider-Man. He's such a great character, character he has ever played. I'm sorry, what was it you said? He, he's an underplayed character, and I feel like he's such a great character. And yeah, you never right. quite get enough Robbie. Is There's always a thing he knows more. He knows a lot more about Peter Parker than he's saying. I don't know if, like, I'm looking at these pages. They're they're good Spider-Man pages, but they're just not the way Romita would have done them. And they just feel a little, I don't know, less uncontrol or something to me. And Buscema's, very, you know, very famous for his Silver Surfer, his Avengers, his Conan. Um, and he did a great job on the Fantastic Four, but I think he just wasn't right for Spider-Man. But they still, you know, it's it's well done action. So yeah, it I is. Think I would Sorry, just overly <laughs> I'm tweeting obsessing. someone hoping to get an answer. Um. A sixty-four page special says, "Read Spectacular Spider-Man. You'll get too much Robbie." Oh, that's interesting. Which collection? He says Spectacular Spider-Man, so I, I assume he means... Oh, that might make sense, yeah, because uh, Amazing Spider-Man was trying to hit on the villains and the big stuff, whereas Spectacular is focusing more on different stuff, and the Daily Bugle became a big part of like what separated them. Like, his work life was kind of a determining factor in how that played in. So more of the newsman to superhero, they tried to play up in one angle, whereas Amazing was more your standard superhero comparatively, I guess. So one of my feelings about this, like I really liked the sort of intro story that, that, that was more the Magia story with a little bit of the lizard, but then these two issues of the lizard feel like a repetition of the lizard's last appearance, only let's throw in the human torch to make it different. And that's really the, to me, the only difference. And maybe I'm oversimplifying, but. Now that's kind of a lesser Romita cover. I'm less happy with that cover, but. And you could argue that Buscema is making the lizard more lizard-like. It almost looks like a snake coming out of clothing there. But Spider-Man does not look that good there. But the human torch looks hot. 
Yeah. The Sorry. Human Torch is in a typical Fantastic Four pose, and, and Buscema probably recently came off of the Fantastic Four. Maybe he was still also... I don't know if you could have drawn Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, and Silver Surfer at the same time, but who knows? And I have to ask, how did you feel about the Human Torch just coming into this fight? I kind of resented his presence. Like I say, I feel like he was just... He was a kind of a MacGuffin of a sort, a plot, a plot gimmick to just stretch out the plot, maybe. See, I thought it was interesting because last time there was this whole play with the cold, and now you have the Human Torch, and he's fighting him, but he could totally take out the lizard. But apparently, this fight with the lizard, as opposed to every other Spider-Man fight, is blocking out most of downtown. Like it's a big deal. Right. Again, the lizard is a relatively big threat compared to most Spider-Man villains in any given right. fight. He's a real dog. Although... chunks of buildings off and they're falling down into the streets and stuff. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of Hulk light. Um, but he's not really controlling. Like, I, as much as, like, him, his physical presence and his ability, his maneuverability is a big threat, I understand that, just physical prowess. But the idea that he can control lizards, snakes, alligators, all reptiles, and have them stuck on you right. is... Interesting. Also, if there's ever a Ninja Turtles Spider-Man crossover, I expect that will be an element that comes to the <laughs> That will be countered with the Rat King. And uh, will, anyways. will Ninja Turtles side with uh, their their reptilian brethren? Are turtles reptiles? I guess they are. Um, I yeah. do have to say, looking back over it, Buscema and is doing a great job of this kind of sense of vertigo of fall. <laughs> Everyone's falling from the buildings. Yeah, but it's a lot of the four panels as opposed to, as we were pointing out earlier, the uh, right. mix of different He doesn't panels. mix it up as much. He's more in a rush, I think, to finish the story. Well, he's doing it quick, right? Um, I've heard Ramita say that he was a very slow artist, which makes, I'm now realizing, I used to think it was a solid block of Ramita, you know, from Ditko on to, like, on, you know, on past Gwen Stacy's death, but really there were a lot of other artists working on this along the way. Right. <clears throat> Plus, Romita was a big cover artist, so he probably spent a lot of time on that. Um, do they yeah. still do the tradition of the Spider-Man and the Human Torch being rivals? I mean, they, they play a little bit. It's more at the end here in this one. It's kind of quick. I mean, I feel like that. I feel like you're supposed to know the element between them in this one. And I feel like some of the jocular stuff's kind of coming in. But at the same time, for Spider-Man, this is like a real human drama he's trying to deal with. And he can't tip the human torch the real deal, which I find insane. Like, right. Spider-Man's supposed to be, a, maybe not, if you don't consider him a genius, he's supposed to be freaking smart. And the idea of saying, like, hey, man, don't kill the lizard, because, A, we don't kill right. anyone. So what's up with all of a sudden this guy you're okay killing? Like, right. that hit me as the weirdest part. But well, also... They occasionally kill monsters, and he some... <laughs> right, somehow but... doesn't believe Spider-Man there's a human inside or something. But, I mean, Spider-Man doesn't have to tip him to it being Kurt Connors. Right. He just has to say, like, he, the lizard transforms. Right. There's an innocent human at the right. corner of the lizard. And that's all right. I have to say. At the side of this, remind you of anyone? Cough, right. hack, and grim. I don't know. But, yeah. Like, well, but Spider Man also just assumes, hey, Torch, you got to get out of here. You're ruining my plan. Not, hey, this guy's human. Let's work together and figure something out. And right, it's, it's just Stan Lee's trope when he runs out of any other plot idea just to have the superheroes misunderstand each other, no matter how illogical it is. It just feels like the Human Torch makes Spider-Man stupid, which is, I don't know, not very fun. <laughs> Jason Bonney's asking me to go page by page for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would if I thought of that from the very beginning, but... Uh, I've kind of, I don't want to. <laughs> We're not law box discussion now. Um, but yeah, and I feel like they were trying to do something with them fighting underwater too. But 
It's just also, a there's foreshadowing. There's a smokestack. Yeah. I'm willing to bet you there's supposed that's supposed to be the smokestack he threw the clone out. Wait, did that happen yet? Shoot, maybe I'm the clone? Yeah, the initial clone story, uh, Spider-Man throws the clone down a smokestack. No, I don't think that hap happens for quite a while longer. Yeah, okay. I don't think smoke the clone comes the Bronze Age. Is that right? It's a Stan Lee story. The clone story I thought was a Jerry Conway was the first clone story. Oh, this is going to bother me. Anyways, go on. Molly. So, um... Yeah, I, I shouldn't. Uh, John Buscema is a perfectly fine stand-in for Romita, but I do. I really love Romita, and it's the Romita issues that sing for me. You're right. And, and it may be that um, I'm right about uh, who wrote the first clone story. Yeah, yeah, you are. I don't know it from deep Spider-Man knowledge. I remember them t talking about it in the book, um, The Untold Story of Marvel Comics, or whatever it was called. They spent a lot of time focusing on Spider-Man and the Jerry Conway era and, and such. Huh. You know, and I, I just, I think that I, I hypothesize that, well, both Ditko and then Romita really related in some way to the Spider-Man stories. And because of the Marvel method, it was, a lot had to do with what the artist put in the story and then Stanley would respond to it. So I think that that the ways in which this story seems a little flatter might in part be because of, of what, that John Buscema was just doing a job more than John Romita was. Um, but that's just a guess, you know, hi hypothesis. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, it is a little, also this whole, the Human Torch coming in on this one just fell flat. Right. Like, it, it didn't really add anything. It just threw in this unnecessary element that took us away from... I mean, the problem is, is like, what would it be? Just another lizard story? Though it would be the third lizard story. So it feels like you right. don't quite have a mold and function yet. But Maybe it was the, like, well, what... We've decided to bring back the lizard, John Romita or Stanley and John Romita together, put him in this last story. What can we do with him in these next two issues that John Buscema, who's well known as a Fantastic Four artist, would do well? Throw in the Human Torch. Yeah. Um, it just... Of course, putting, putting other superheroes on your covers, I suspect, helped sales. Sure. I just, the Human Torch also just feels like a particularly bad pick here because they don't really play off the Human Torch and Spider Man who have a right. history. Ben uh, Grimm would be a much more interesting foe of the Lizard. They're two humans turned into monsters. But Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. It's the turn there and the connection there. I think it's something they're almost trying to play off of, but the story never gets there. Yeah. The connection never gets there. And. It just kind of suffers for it. And then the Human Torch essentially goes away because Spider-Man tricks him by saying he has some stupid power he doesn't have. Though, to be fair, the idea of trying to figure out what make-believe power is, who has and doesn't have is... I don't know. <laughs> well, but then you get Billy coming in again. Here's Billy, the yeah. Billy element. Um, Does Billy ever grow up and become a villain himself or something, that would be interesting. Uh, I don't think so. Not really. He's I think he has some... They de-age him again and make him a little kid. I think he has some painful teen years or something, but... Yeah. Um, God, the transformation... I've got, I've got to take this lizard serum and get rid of them. <laughs> um, but Billy comes in, the lizard is able to attack him, and then... Spider-Man saves the day. The transformation from Lizard to Kurt Connors, though, is uh, interesting looking. Visually? Yeah. It is kind of that monster-to-man idea. Yeah. I think uh, I think uh, Usema actually is better at doing the Lizard than he is at doing Spider-Man. Hmm. I don't have my screen share on anymore, but... All good. 
I guess I could try. I'm seeing some lizard pictures I'm really liking. <laughs> now that I, I was very, before when I was being unhappy with this, I was very focused on how Spider-Man was being drawn. Um, but I think both of these panels are very, you know, the lizard is just climbing sideways along this wall here. And that's quite cool. Yeah. And then again, he's got that kind of snaky, lizardy feeling to his body. But yeah, like I don't like this Spider-Man pose there. I, Fusema just doesn't have the Spider-Man pose down for me. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just an awkward angle in general. It's not some like dynamic wow. Yeah. Thing and he's he's looking up into the sky while he thwips his web down to catch the lizard, and his whole body is turned away from the lizard. <laughs> but not that Romita's poses were logical so much as um, Ditko's poses were logical, but Romita's are more dramatic anyway. Now here the torch forgot to un take the fire off his hand, so he's burning the lizard's skin. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting to see. I mean, I th if I remember correctly with that, that Morbius story that I like and you don't like, by then... Connor and Peter Parker are closer, or Connor and Spider-Man are closer. And right. I think as that develops, that gives the spider, the lizard a new interesting angle that he's kind of a confidant of Spider-Man and not just, you know, the, the one, well, not the one note, but the notes of, you know, the family horror. But now there's something, as they find something more to do with it, whereas here, Stanley kind of, played the same thing again right and i mean i think we're starting to get to a point where stanley is maybe getting a little stale with his right spider-man well, stuff and stanley i mean he progressed comics somewhat but he's still thinking that readers go away right you know, so if you redo the same story three years later no one's gonna know uh, right but that that is changing and well also i mean change now but <laughs> Yeah, access at the time and whatnot. It's it's a different thing. Yeah. No, I can tell you as a eleven year old, twelve year old boy, comics from three years ago were very hard to come by. And when you did come by them, they were just treasures without you being very critical of them, of course. <laughs> um, and you rarely came by all the all the issues you needed. So that also left you feeling like there were more complexities to the plot than there actually were. <laughs> so have I, maybe I've, I've complained so much about John Buscema that I haven't let you give your opinion on these issues as much as you would have. I mean, I said a bit about John Buscema, like, Buscema, I cannot share his name. Uh, I, I'm not I, really I, sure, sure if it's Buscema or Buscema or Buscema. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think he's an all right Spider-Man guy, but I mean, yeah, he's not going to live up to the greats. And especially when he's filling in to try to look like one of the greats. Um, right. Well, and they didn't know that they were greats at the time. <laughs> no, but I, I think they're, I mean, maybe not greats, but I mean, I think you had to know, like, there's a reason why John Romita was the main guy and this guy was the fill-in, right? Right, like, right. There's just some deafness of craft that, I mean, as the years progressed on, it's continued to stand out, I think, definitely shines a light on it. But even at the time, you know, like, they knew he had the stuff, and this other guy, you know, could do a comic, but he was trying to be this guy. Um. Salute to Gore Vidal, who's left a comment. He said, the human, the, the human Torch appears in the new Peter Parker book. 
ironic since now the Fantastic Four has been relegated to the dustbin by Marvel, once a <laughs> moneymaker. I'm very curious because Marvel's announced they're going to do Marvel 2 in 1. Um, no, I thought it was once, the Fantastic 2. I think they've now decided to call it the Marvel 2 in 1, which was used to be a team up book of the thing teaming up with different Marvel characters back in the Bronze Age. Um, but it, at least the first issue, but maybe the whole series will be him and the Torch teaming up. So it's like they're going to get rid of Sue Storm and and Reed Richards and just have the other two for now anyway. Um, but so did you, did you like this third lizard story in the three that we've read as much as, I think you were saying maybe you liked it better than the second one. Um... I think I was saying that now I'm not so sure after going through it more with you. Um, I, uh, my opinions <laughs> influence No, no, no. It's going through it with you and then looking at it again. Um, I, I mean, the second story feels like the first real lizard story. Because the first one, like you said, kind of hokey, kind of there. Done and out and put on a few stills. The second one comes in. But there's still some of that plot contrivance going on. This one... Maybe a little less of that some, but the human torch element uh -huh. really comes in and yeah, it, so maybe it, the lizard element is less contrived this time. Right. Because it fits so well into the development of the previous issue. But then the human torch becomes the contrivance. Yeah, it feels like there just has to be a little little something. It'd be funny if they did comics where in every issue, Spider-Man's fights were interrupted by some other superhero coming by. <laughs> right. Because you would think anytime it's against someone creating enough destruction that that would bring the notice of other heroes. <laughs> Undead Quinn says the Human Torch was barely, I, I think there's a typing error there, but maybe recognizable or... And I don't oh, it didn't know look he like means, the... I assume he means in the new Peter Parker book, um, which I, oh. I've i heard exists. It's supposed to be like, a, is it more about... The chips it's supposed to be more going back to the roots of Peter Parker somehow? Yeah, but it's supposed to be in continuity, which I don't know how you reconcile. So have you read it yet? I have not, because it was a $5 issue or something, and I just didn't care yeah i'll read it someday i'm sure i just didn't i pay five or six dollars a month to get marvel unlimited so <laughs> it seems right. ridiculous to spend five dollars for one issue but yeah i just i looked at it i had a friend the, i have a friend at the comic shop who works there and he was trying to sell me on it because we're both big spider-man fans he's like it's chip zadarsky man i'm like is it chip zadarsky <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's who it is, Chip Sidarsky. Yeah. And I'm like, what's he done, really? He's like, Jughead. I'm like, okay, that's a knock against him. What else has he done? How is the duck? Right, he's done a few of these things, and he worked on sex criminals. I'm like, but wasn't he the artist for sex criminals? Right. Well, yeah, but I'm like, well, then I don't care about his writing for Spider-Man based on the art of another book. Not to say he's not a talented guy, but like, right. his name isn't what's going to sell me on another Spider-Man book that's going to be done in 13 issues or whatever. I just... Yeah. Well, for me, all of Marvel, whether I read it digitally or some other way, is to be read after the fact, because it's just the pricing and the events. Anyway, we've been through all that before, but... All right. I did. I was listening to a podcast today. Um, it's called Wait What? And it's kind of an annoying podcast, but also interesting. And they were wondering, you know, with the when people, re retailers are talking about, you know, whether digital hurts their sales. At this point, is Marvel Unlimited one of the factors that is lowering Marvel's sales? It has but to be. Certainly, if you if you don't mind digital and you don't mind waiting six months to read stories, the economics are just amazing to do Marvel Unlimited. Right? It's it's basically an all-you-can-eat buffet for $6 a month. Yeah. 
if you, well, you can pay month you can pay monthly for ten dollars a month but if you get pay for the whole year that's the price i'm referring to yeah no that's that's something undead quinn i think still probably referring to the peter parker book says the book felt weak <laughs> uh, which is not i have not been a big fan of the Chip Sadarsky writing I've read. He's not a terrible writer, but he is a little on the less interesting side. Um, I don't think I've read any of his stuff. So I, I've read a few issues of Howard the Duck. I read a few issues of um, Jughead, and uh, with my daughter, and we gave up on reading it. We were both kind of bored, and then we're jumping back on it now that the guy who writes Squirrel Girl is writing it. So what's, are you reading the main Dan Slott Spider-Man book right now? Yeah, I've been, I mean, I've been getting Amazing Spider-Man forever now, so. So have, you've never dropped it? Because I thought maybe you had dropped it at some point. I, um, I dropped when, see, the times I've dropped Spider-Man since I've been collecting it since uh, JMS was writing it was, right after the Gwen clone thing happened. Um, then again, right after one more day, but then I recollected most of that. And then I dropped when superior was happening. Cause I just didn't care at the time. And it bothered me. I've since gone back and read it and it's a really interesting arc. I feel like the transition into and the transition out of are the weakest parts. And then I've just been reading it since. And I read a lot of spider spinoffs but not necessarily everything because that's a whole segment at any given time and the was the recent clone thing its own mini series or was that just yeah, they, through a bunch of books so spider-man's big enough that i mean there's a whole spider office right right um, if you break it down so the clone event if you're trying to read it, I feel like they had the Clone Conspiracy Mini, which was effect effectively an event book that had spinoffs. But I feel like I don't know how the heck you could have parsed what's going on unless you're reading at least uh, the Clone Conspiracy Mini stuff, Alpha, Omega, and the issues between, and Amazing. If you weren't reading those two, I feel like you wouldn't be getting everything you need to understand the story. There was a Prowler thing going on at the time, and there was some connections to some other books. There's a Cloak and Dagger thing that came in. Whoever cares about Cloak and Dagger? <laughs> I don't know. Some, um, does. Yeah, some people do, clearly. I just, I, I think it's because they're Christian element. I was always like, I didn't like them for that. So, um, so you did you did pick up the clone conspiracy and and you're already reading amazing yeah the clone conspiracy made me re-fall in love with dan slot because oh, interesting the trick he pulled with the clone conspiracy was the biggest gamble i've seen playing off of everything i kind of hated one way or another spider-man i mean you're dealing with clones you're dealing with a lot of characters dying off immediately coming back you're playing off of a lot of like soap opera pressure points and he's doing all these things and he's doing it all at once he's doing all these effective like sins of comics and he's playing off of it and then he hit an ending that made it all work and continued forward and then we get a little seed of what marvel has to do and have some spin off of it and it's spun off into the scarlet spider book we have going which is effectively Peter David getting to do a Spider-Man version of Deadpool. And I'm just all about all of that whole thing. Uh -huh. So Right, the words Peter David, Spider-Man, and Deadpool, those are like practically tattooed on your stomach or something. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I felt bad because I was reading the Scarlet Spider book and I'm like, this is everything for years. I was saying I didn't want to see for Marvel. They're playing off some old book with some character that had some nostalgia for him, but really <laughs> if they wanted to play the smart money and move forward, they'd find something new to do. It's playing off of a major property. It's only using known proven talent to try to push this B book on people that people don't really want. It's Peter David and Mark Bagley. And I'm like, God, it's all of that stuff I didn't like, but all exactly the way I like it. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I'm buying this book. This like, if you had to make a book for me, this is hitting like 
every note. It's, ah. Uh. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. That sounds good. I'm glad Peter David is still able to pull his, pull the Peter David out of his hat. Yeah, how old is he now? Scary. And he did have like a stroke or something. He had some major yeah. health thing. Yeah, it put him down know. for a while. So Gore Vidal says, and it's talking about the Peter Parker book, that he got it for free. He says he appears at the end of the story trying to pick up a girl who's waiting for Peter. Um, must be the Human Torch. Mystery girl who happens to be... And then Undead Quinn says he did too many jokes. And then Undead Quinn says, or his sister. So the, so the Human Torch tries to pick up Johnny's sister, or what? does the Human Torch try to pick up Peter Parker's sister? I'm not sure. And Gore Vidal says that's how Johnny burns. Anyway, someday I'll yes. read it on Marvel Unlimited and I'll understand. Chip Zdarsky does seem like he he's probably a funny guy, but he tries too hard to be funny or something. I don't know. Um, I've never, never touched it. So I'm not going to presume to presume to know, but yeah. Well, this is definitely wet my whistle for more Spider-Man. So we should we should plan on another one, I guess, following the lizard further on his career. Make sure to cover that one that is your childhood favorite. No matter, we can make fun of your childhood taste if we want, or or be very gentle to you. I I think we'll be fine to make fun of it. Actually, looking through some of the stuff that came later, I think it's a complete rehash of an earlier story. Uh -huh. I didn't know. I feel like Todd McFarlane did the lizard. I, I feel like I can picture a Todd There's McFarlane. There's one issue, and it, it's a very memorable cover. Um, That's probably why I remember it then. I, we can hit it. I mean, it's one issue, so. Undead Quinn says he questions the rave review of the Peter Parker book from comic reviewers. Um, Gore Vidal says the mystery girl, Theresa, or Teresa, who claims to be Peter's sister. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of her? I, I'm completely on I, no. <laughs> well, that's interesting to have a sister of his turn up, I suppose. Um, so, there's one dangling, earlier you mentioned, because for me, I think Romita and Ditko are my favorite Spider-Man artists. You said they are not your favorite Spider-Man artists. Do you have a single favorite Spider-Man artist you can point to? I'm almost guessing it's gonna be the John Romita Jr.'s second time on Spider-Man during this yeah, period. Yeah, basically, yeah, with Scott Hanna on inks. Um, I, I mean, to this day, yeah. I mean, that's when I really got into Spider-Man. And looking back at it, there's a lot in there that I really like. I like the texture and feel of what's going on. I like the way he handled certain characters. I think that's pretty much my favorite. There's a handful of other artists I do really enjoy. And I feel like there's just some stuff that comes in later that I like. And maybe they just had access to technology to make it. Yeah. Uh, Better, but. Well, from what I remember, because I only read a few of those later John Romita Jr. issues, but it does seem like maybe that was John Romita Jr.'s stylistic peak, and now he's gone a little too far in some direction. But I think half of it is uh, Hannah on inks is oh, really, really okay. sets him apart. Um, Jason Bonin says something about torment storyline is maybe is that where the sister comes from or maybe he's referring to something else maybe. said it lasted five issues yeah that was oh the torment spider yeah that's uh that's the initial run oh that is McFarlane spider-man but that's when he got his own book uh -huh. um that's where right. he's saying yeah. that's when the lizard showed up maybe that is there's one issue of amazing that he had it but yeah there's that that's why it was such a big thing yeah because it was this big lizard storyline it launched the spider-man book that was the mcfarland spider-man book i think they're trying to hang on to him right before the whole image thing went down right um yeah that's that's it so maybe there's some sister thing in there um yeah well i i think i would like to look at 
at uh, McFarland Spider-Man at some point because I <clears throat> I did not read a lot of it originally. I, at the time he came out, I couldn't stand the manga-esque elements in it. I was prejudiced. Okay. <clears throat> but also, I remember buying his Spider-Man number one and thinking it was terribly written, but... <laughs> well, I, I will not vouch for his writing, that's mm. for sure. But I, I feel like I admire McFarlane more now than I did at the time. That's interesting. I, I've taken on a fascination of that guy because of reading so much Spawn, but... <clears throat> well, and I think he was, I don't know, I feel like he was quite daring going against the grain of what had been done in recent decades before him. And, and being daring paid off for him in a big way. Yeah. I, I mean, you can't argue the legacy, I guess. You can't argue the, yeah, the success. Yeah. Um, well, it'll be interesting if we do move on, we'll, I think we'll get to see a uh, Gil Kane Spider-Man, which in my nostalgic memory is great Spider-Man, but I'll see whether I still think so when I reread re it. It's a different era, that's for sure. Well, Gil Kane was another one who kind of filled in for Romita, but was a more frequent fill-in artist, I think, than Busema. <clears throat> Or Busima or Bushema. Right. But often uh, Romita inked Gil Kane. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, with that yawn, I think <laughs> I think I'm gonna bring the proceeds to a close. With any any more thoughts on the lizard and Spider Man at this point? Or shall we just say goodnight? Um, I mean, I think we've gone through what we have here. <laughs> I'm guessing that we've been talking for about two hours nearly. Yeah, I think we've probably hit what we need to hit. Yeah, which is too much. But for those people who stayed with us and 64-page special still here, Jason Bonin, Undead Quinn, Gore Vidal. Earlier we had uh, Rez Reeds. And um, is there anyone else? And Mr. Gretzky, uh, your longest time viewer. Um, thanks to all of you guys for showing up. And thanks for anyone who's watched after the fact. Um, we do do these just for ourselves, but I do apologize for how long we let it track on. <laughs> so uh, we'll be back with more either on my channel or on Wednesday Serial. So be sure to subscribe to Wednesday Serial if you don't already. Um, he's been kind of quiet lately, just yeah. reading away and keeping his thoughts to himself. That's it. <laughs> but he has given so much to this community in like the past 45 years that um, we should really appreciate him. I'm jokingly referring to the fact that Matt has been doing videos either as Agent 42Q or Wednesday Serial since, what, eight years? Ah, uh, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. So since he was in third grade or something. Um, exactly. <laughs> I'm getting punch drunk from being sleepy. But um, thanks a lot for, for joining me, Matt, and for having this idea. Um, or melding this idea with my old idea, whatever, however this all came about. So uh, good night, everyone. Good night.